Now we're going to run through the actual physical types of evidence, right? These are just different pieces of paper or electronic documents, whatever you want to think about. I like to think of them, about them as a physical piece of paper. Now let's talk through. These are items you may see. You know, you can see them on other exams as well. However, these are going to be the types of evidence that you collect as the auditor. You're going to sample transactions. You're going to pick out certain transactions that you want to test. And then based on those transactions, you are going to get certain pieces of evidence, such as remittance advices, shipping documents, bank statements, to support those transactions to verify that they are correct. Let's begin with what is a remittance advice? Well, that is a notice that is sent to a supplier of goods or services to inform them that, of the payment that has been made. So this is going to be something where I am going to buy. Let's say in all these circumstances, I am ABC company. And as ABC company, I am making purchases from XYZ company. Now, XYZ company is over here. We as ABC company, we are going to send this remittance advice to XYZ company. And it's basically saying we, we paid you, right? It's a, a notice that saying this is X amount of dollars we paid you, paid on this date. We used a credit card or we used a cash, a check, whatever it may be. And what's the purpose of this? Well, it can be used to verify that payments have been made as agreed. So XYZ is going to use this. So forgetting auditing for a second, the companies, XYZ is going to use this and check it against their documentation to make sure that everything's accurate. And then this kind of covers ABC's butts, right? It makes it, uh, hey, look, we actually did pay you. And here's actually the details of that payment. Now, the auditor can obviously use this to verify expense, expenditures, all of these transactions. A shipping document is used to track the movement of goods and shipments. It can be used to verify the accuracy of invoices, to track inventory, and to monitor the progress of shipments. This is going to be a piece of paper that is included with inventory. So when the receiving department receives inventory, they are going to open a box and it's going to have some shipping documentation in there. Obviously, the auditor can examine this shipping documentation, say, okay, there was uh, 10 pieces of inventory in this box. Why don't I see 10 pieces of inventory in the warehouse relating to the shipping document? There you go. Great way to audit. Next up, we have the bank statement. And this is a summary of all transactions that have occurred over a set period of time on a bank account. You probably all are quite familiar with your own personal bank statements. And if you're not, you probably should be. Definitely a good thing to look at for your own personal finance. Bank statements are used to provide evidence of the financial activity of a company. Bank statement should agree with the cash activity in the general ledger. Perfect. Looking through some other types of audit evidence, right? We've got these documents that the, the auditor is going to likely use to verify and corroborate what they find in the client's accounting records. We have the receiving report. This is used to document and track the receipt of goods and services. We're going to think more so goods here, however. Just think of physical goods. It's easier to conceptualize. The report typically includes the date of the receipt. So this is proof that we actually received what we ordered, what we said we received, the name of the supplier, a description of the goods received, the quantity received, and the cost. This is used to reconcile the invoices with the goods or the services. This is going to be used by the auditor to verify, hey, we ordered something, we purchased something, and we actually did receive it, right? It's going to be used to verify the existence of goods. It's going to be used to verify the existence of legitimate expenses, all of those transactions. Next up, we have this bill of lading, which is a document used to verify the accuracy of a shipment of goods. This lists the quantity and type of goods being shipped. So this is created when you're shipping inventory to a customer. Think of it like that. It's going to include a lot of information, including the origin, where it's shipped from, the destination, where it's shipped to, and the date of the shipment. This is going to be used to verify that the shipment of goods arrives at the destination and that the goods are in the correct quantity and quality. You're going to have this bill of lading and it's going to say there are 10 pieces of inventory in this box. If it shows up with nine, you know that someone may have stolen uh, one of the pieces of inventory while it was on the road. It is what the authority to accept incoming goods in the receiving department is based on. So the receiving department is going to look in the box. And if everything in the box matches up with the bill of lading that is also in the box, we're good to go right? It matches up. There's no discrepancies. And it's just as important for a company to, if they want, if hopefully they want to have solid accounting practices and run a solid, efficient business. 
So hopefully the company uses it and then the auditor is going to use it as well to verify the accuracy of transactions. Purchase order. This is something that you can encounter as well. I mean, you personally could encounter a lot of these in your, your everyday life when you just buy things, if you, maybe if you sell things, if you work through eBay. This is a purchase order, which is a document. It's used to request goods or services from another organization. Now, you may not actually see a purchase order. However, generally when you buy something on Amazon, let's say, when you get that email, it says you have purchased one uh, football jersey and it costs $50. That is going to be your purchase order. Now, even though a purchase order is submitted and you formally request to buy something, doesn't mean the order has actually been accepted yet. Um, now, for Amazon, obviously, it's pretty quickly accepted. And you know, if Amazon uh, was in the business of not accepting every order, they wouldn't be doing as well. Just a note there, something we actually see in FAR in governmental accounting, we have different processes and different journal entries, even when you just send the purchase order. And then once it's actually accepted, you have a different journal entries there. So just keep that in mind. The purchase order is what you submit when you actually want to buy something. And then the, the supplier, those selling the goods will have to accept the purchase order and say, cool, we want to sell to you. Because also let's think big companies, right? Yes, Amazon just you know selling $20 gadgets on, on their website. But when you're dealing with big manufacturing companies, the company's going to accept the purchase order. They're going to take it in and then check your credit because maybe you know they don't want to sell you $20,000 worth of goods, you know, this is large business to business transactions, they're going to assess and say, okay, maybe no, 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 this company has bad credit, we're not actually going to sell to them. That's going to be something they're going to take into account. Just a couple, just some background on the purchase order, pretty helpful to understand what it is, how it's used and the importances of it in the business cycle. The auditor is going to use this to make sure that all purchases are actually properly documented and authorized. A lot of times before a purchase order is sent to uh, a seller, right? If we are the company who wants to buy something, we need to go through an approval process. So I draft up a purchase order and I have to get it approved by a manager because if I just started spending all of my own company's funds on things I wanted to buy, well, it's not really uh, an appropriate use of my own company's funds. Next up, a vendor invoice is used to support the existence of a vendor transaction. This is going to be once we send a purchase order, we buy something from the vendor, the vendor then sends us an invoice and says, pay us, you know, $20,000. This invoice is going to have the vendor's name, the address, and contact info, as well as the date, invoice number, which is important. We want to make sure that there are no duplicate invoice numbers, and a description of the goods or services purchased. The auditor is going to use this, again, to verify the existence of actual transactions, right? Rather than just trusting that all the transactions listed actually exist, we are going to need to get some verification. And this is a great piece of evidence to check. Next, we have the packing slip. This is a document. It's usually sent with the shipped goods that detail the contents of the shipment. In auditing, the packing slip can be used to verify the accuracy of the goods that were shipped. All right, so this is going to be shipped with the goods and details the contents of the shipment. Very good there. Looking good all around. Here is a nice summary of all we saw with our audit evidence. We have our remittance advice. And where does this come from? This comes from the payer and it's sent to the payee. The use here, it's to verify that payments have been made as agreed. Next, we have the shipping document. This is uh, sent from the supplier to the client. This is to verify the accuracy of invoices and to track the inventory. Next, we have the receiving report. This is from the client to the supplier and supplier being the seller, right? Just keeping that in mind as well. The client is who we're auditing. So in this case, the client is buying something. And how do we use this? We use this to reconcile supplier invoices with the actual goods received. Next, we have the bill of lading, and this is this comes from the client supplier. It's used to verify the receipt of goods and their quantity. Next, we have the purchase order. This comes from the client's purchasing department, where you could have a lot of authorization going around there. This is used to verify that all purchases are documented and properly authorized. The vendor invoice, this comes from the client supplier. This is used to support the existence of a vendor transaction. The packing slip is coming from the client supplier, which verifies the accuracy of all the goods shipped. And lastly, the bank statement comes from the client's blank and it ties out the cash account. Make sure you're familiar with all of these types of audit evidence. A couple more slides here, tying it out. What are our types of client accounting records? 
Well, this is super important. We've got the trial balance. And for those of you who have not worked actually in accounting yet, it may be hard to conceptualize. I know it kind of was for me before I actually you know, saw real trial balances and worked in actual financial statements in the real world. Well, this is just a list of all of the accounts for a business and their balances at a specific point in time. It's used to help verify the accuracy of the financial statements. You have a trial balance. And just as the name implies, it's a trial. So it's not the final end product, but it is essentially the balance sheet. It's what's going to form the balance sheet and the income statement. And it's essentially the pre-balance sheet, pre-income statement. Next, we have the bank rec. This is used to reconcile the ending cash balance for the company's books with the ending cash balance for the bank statement. And I've got an example trial balance. I'll show you actually in a second. Next, we have the cash receipts and disbursements journal. This is used as kind of a, a conglomeration of all the organization's cash receipts and disbursements. The journal can be used to track the cash inflows and outflows. Obviously, cash is one of the more important accounts there, as well as to identify any discrepancies between the two. It ties in well with the bank rec to display the annual activity between the beginning and ending cash balances. As promised, here is an actual unadjusted trial balance. Now, a couple of things to note, we have some balance sheet accounts, we have some income statement accounts, and we've got that all tied out here, very looking very nice. A couple points to keep in mind. Generally, we've got these account numbers and you'll see all assets here start with the, the number one. Looks like the liabilities start with the number two. We've got equity accounts with the number three, and then we have a jump to our income statement accounts. We've got six and seven for revenue and expenses. We've got them at their normal natural balances. So assets are going to be debited and liabilities can be credited. And we've got our income statement accounts down here. These, just like the accounting equation, balance out the debits and the credits have to equal each other. And if they don't, you obviously have a problem. Now, this is, again, what is going to form the financial statements, right? We just see all the numbers that will go into them. And this is where anyone can come in and adjust these amounts to make sure they're accurate. And this is just something you'll work with a lot. So it's just something I get familiar with. It's something you're going to for sure see a lot in the real world. The more trial balances you can see, the more, <laughs> the more familiar you'll get with this quite all too important concept. This is what we are looking at. And we've got one more slide going through some more evidence. Some more types of accounting records, just running through here. We got a number of different payroll records that can be used. Now, these are types of evidence that we're going to use. Now, when we're auditing the payroll expense, employee compensation, we could look at time cards, payroll registers. You know, we're familiar with the, what those are. Uh, just records of employees working, how much they've worked, how much they should be being paid. Another fraudulent uh, possibility here is that, employ that certain managers are creating fake employees and collecting their wages for them. So we want to make sure that any actual disbursements of cash towards employees are from a legitimate source, from legitimate wages, making sure that expenses are accurate. We want to make sure that we know how many employees worked, how long they worked, and the, the wages and hours are accurate. Accounts receivable aging schedule. This is going to make you aware of how long invoices have been outstanding. That's pretty important to kind of look through the risk of non-payment and determine whether a company can accurately assess how much of their receivables, how much money owed to them is going to be resulting in a bad debt and bad debt being money you will not receive from customers because they're bankrupt because they just refuse to pay you, you know, anything like that, uh, dis disagreements. So that would be a situation to be aware of. Accounts receivable aging schedules are going to be pretty important for assessment because if a lot of accounts receivable are listed as being, let's say, 120 days outstanding, that's a little bit abnormal. And as a company, you should probably write a lot of those off and realize that if you have balances owed to you that are longer than 120 days outstanding, you're probably not going to receive that money just in kind of standard accounting practices. A fixed asset roll forward is used to help verify the existence and accuracy of a company's fixed assets. Essentially just a schedule that lists out all of the fixed assets, all the depreciation and shows the depreciation throughout the years and periods. It lists all the company's fixed assets at the beginning of the year and tracks any changes, any additions, any disbursements of fixed assets, any disposals. This information can be used to verify that the depreciation expense is accurate and the balance sheet correctly reflects the value of its fixed assets. And then lastly here, the debt roll forward. This is going to use to show how the balance of a company's debt has changed. It's going to show other borrowings, original balances, going to show interest payments, accrued interest. It's going to obviously show an imbalance. 
going to be used to assess the financial health of the company and identify any potential red flags with its debt. Very good looking good there. Hey there, are you ready to not only pass your CPA exams, but truly understand and enjoy the material while studying? I know it seems impossible, right? Especially to enjoy the material. We'll do it together. Tap into the power of cpa.examprep.ai, where we've got personalized quizzes, multiple choice questions, memorization guides, flashcards, simulations, all tailored to your learning. Our adaptive study planning puts you on the fastest path to success and lifts you back up if you fall behind. Avoid wasting your precious time and money attempting an exam with a low chance of passing because who wants that? We want to get you through this process as quick as possible. Our exam readiness prediction lets you walk in with confidence knowing that you're prepared for success on exam day. Thankfully, there's no payment method needed to get started. So why don't you come join us? Visit cpa.examprep.ai and let's achieve your exam success together.